welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for reaching out. Absolutely. So before we get into the awesome things that you're doing on your podcast, I wanted uh, my audience to get to know you a little bit more. So tell me your career story. Sure. So um, my career kind of started after my undergraduate degree. Um, I studied international relations and I thought I was going to be kind of, you know, the typical VC thing in politics. And then um, I started uh, working uh, in government contracting and I kind of uh, evolved from there. So I started uh, doing background investigations and then I discovered this whole field of intelligence analysis, which I wasn't familiar with as much before. So um, there was an opportunity for me to grow and the same company and go into uh, kind of uh, research and analysis in a government law enforcement agency. And then after that, I also found a master's degree in intelligence analysis and decided that I really want to focus in intel analysis. Um, so I continued kind of this path and moved to another government agency, more of an international law enforcement agency and uh, work there in criminal analysis. And then around 2016, I decided that um, I'm gonna leave the government and go to the private sector. And in the private sector, I, um, I dabbled a little bit in cybersecurity, uh, cyber threat intelligence, and then kind of went back into what I love uh, to do, which is intelligence analysis. So I've been in different corporations and right now I'm in a big global corporation doing intelligence analysis, protective intelligence, um, and that's where I am. That's awesome. You know, what's interesting, I also studied um, international relations because I really wanted to like, you know, I was also, you know, I came to, D I, after I graduated, I was like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to go to DC and I'm going to do the awesome, awesome things and go work in the US, in the UN. And then I was like, well, maybe and then later on, I'm not going to share my story here. It's, it's your show essentially, but uh, I can very much relate to to that journey of international relations and wanting to change the world. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit more about kind of um, uh, you you know what inspired you to do what you're doing today because you not only are you having this you know of course the corporate side of you but then you also have this awesome podcast that really talks about speaking with immigrants and I found that super interesting. So tell me a little bit more about how you shifted towards that because um, it's, it's so different from what your day yeah. job is. Absolutely. So um, I was born in Ukraine and then I grew up in Israel and I immigrated twice in my life and I had different struggles in the two immigrations and I had struggles when I was in college here and then kind of when I uh, graduated and got into the career world, the struggles really changed. And um, uh, several years ago at uh, one of my conferences that I went for work, actually I was asked to participate on a diversity and inclusion panel. And there was another uh, female there that was going to talk about uh, diversity uh, and inclusion in uh, kind of like uh, for colored people that people of color, sorry. And then there was another female that was going to talk about diversity and inclusion with LGBTQ. And I figured, what can I talk about? And then when I thought about it, I realized that there is something that we don't talk about much in that sometimes diversity is not something that is very evident to the naked eye. And I've struggled a lot with my accent and just being timid about it and presenting and all that. So that's what I kind of talked about. Uh, and that was the first time that I talked about it is, uh, and later when I was done, a um, couple of people really resonated with what I said and they approached me and I started realizing that it's not something that I'm the only one who's facing. So about a year ago, um, I decided to start a podcast, which is part of a bigger social entrepreneurship venture that I'm working on um, to help immigrants to kind of unlock our potential. And what I mean by that is that there are so many things as immigrants that we have that we think that are different and there are our weaknesses, but actually those are very unique strengths that we can use to our advantage. So in the efforts of building a community for immigrants, uh, first online and then in person, what I started a, a year ago, almost, yeah, in January, it's going to be a year, is my podcast, which is called Immigrant Squared. And basically on the podcast is this free, um, like a very safe space for immigrants to and refugees and uh, other organizations that work to help these communities 
to tell their stories, to share their struggles and connect each other on a very human level and like the culture and the things that we have in common. Um, and then it's very therapeutic for a lot of people, including myself, to tell your story and know that you're not the only one um, out there that is struggling. Recently, uh, the past, I think, 10 uh, episodes I've had was a new series that I started called Startup Immigrants, which is more geared towards immigrant entrepreneurs and the struggles that they have and uh, creating a community and supporting each other in our entrepreneurship journey. Mm. Uh, that's really that's, that's a very unique um unique kind of approach so i think that's that's very very cool um and you're right i think just n knowing that you're not alone in a particular situation or you know way it's it's it, it really is powerful because as immigrants you know when we come here it's you know we don't know what we don't know and things are just so different and no matter you know no matter how you know whatever life you've led before it's just difficult no matter where you come from um it's just a new culture new everything um so i think it's a very unique uh, perspective um I, i'm curious um what has been the biggest kind of has there been themes that you see across all your interviews so far w uh, with these yeah, absolutely. Um, individuals so one of the biggest themes and what inspired me to start this series within my podcast about immigrant entrepreneurs is the fact that immigrants are really more likely to start businesses than anybody else, because as immigrants, we have this appetite for risk. We have this resilience and grit. So that has been a very like a common theme that has been coming up. Another common theme that I find really interesting, which inspires me is the fact that people are looking for community. People are looking to share their cuisines, their culture, their traditions, their music. And, you know, there are a lot of organizations out there that are doing great work to help immigrants um, build their resume and find jobs and learn the local languages. Because I've interviewed immigrants all over the world, not only in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But I think um, there could be more done in the aspect of helping people build that community. Mm. And what do you feel is the biggest misconception that people might think um, about immigrants? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that people immigrate by choice. Mm. And sometimes people just really judge like, oh, well, you're here because you chose to be here. Mm. And what they don't understand is that everybody has a story. And sometimes, you know, people, even though they're called immigrants, I mean, there is a lot of difference between asylum seekers, refugees and immigrants, but even immigrants themselves sometimes are not here by choice. And either they're running away from, you know, um, being persecuted because of their sexual orientation, because of crime, because of things that are happening in their, um, you know, country of uh, birth. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think it's a good point. And, and that's why I mean, I think your podcast is so unique in this because it opens up the, you know, again, we don't know what we don't know, right? And some a lot of it is just really just kind of spreading awareness about the first I like it that you separate the, you know, the asylum seekers, the refugees and the immigrants. Um, and, you know, th there is this misconception that people are here because, you know, they're just fighting to come here. And it's, yes, part of it is like, yes, of course, like we're grateful to be here, but also, you know, who wouldn't want to be in their home country if it was well and, and it wasn't corrupted or depending on where you come from or whatever situation you're dealing with, like it's, everybody wants to be home, right? At the yeah. end of the day, like that's why, I, and I'm curious if you've, you've kind of run into this, what I see often, um, so I lived in the Middle East for, for eight years. And so people from all sorts of backgrounds and nationalities, you know, probably over like 150 nationalities, live in, in the UAE and United Arab Emirates. And when you when you're there, you've you know, although everybody's there for a particular purpose, as people get older in their life, and I even see this with my parents as well, um, being, you know, here in the States, is that at the end of the day you kind of uh, you kind of want to go home at some point. You know what I mean? Like you wish to kind of go home to your roots eventually, like even to to retire. You know, if you could, I think that's what people would do. That would be the first choice for them. And I see this when I meet you know, foreigners that are living as expats, you know, it's like, you know, for whatever reason, they left their country, they always long to go back, you know, if they could, you know, so I think that's, um, that's, that, that's interesting, because again, I think it's a big, big misconception. Uh, about yeah, immigrants, you bring no up a really interesting point about home, because that's another theme that always comes up. And I always ask people, 
where is home for you? Where do you feel at home? And you get a variety of very interesting answers because mm -hmm. some people don't feel at home anywhere. Some people feel mm -hmm. like they're citizens of the world. Some people feel at home when they're back in their country of birth. And a lot of people said that they learn to make home wherever they are. And I think that this oh. is really great because even you know if they could go back they still are able to build the community and feel at home uh wherever they are and and i think that that's really hard to do and and also the other thing is the constant struggle between preserving your culture of origin but still kind of blending into the community that you're living in mm -hmm. and i think well, that's something that can be done it's okay to be, you know, diverse and adopt, you know, the culture where you're living. But I think it's also extremely important. And I, and I've seen it with people that I interviewed that it's important to them to preserve their culture of origin and not lose like your identity. Mm, absolutely. Where, where do you fall in that category? Where do you feel home? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Cause I immigrated twice, but honestly, uh, I think I've come to the conclusion that I feel at home wherever my friends, family, and community is. Mm. Um, and right now it's in the US, uh, later it could be elsewhere. Uh, but what I have worked on throughout the years is always making sure that, you know, even though I integrated, I've been here for almost 20 years into the American society, I still do preserve my cultures of origin. And for me, it's both the Ukrainian culture and the Israeli culture. Mm. Yeah, you know, I I, um, I I find it interesting because also I feel like I just make home where I am. I've also I've been in the States for well, I, I was I moved when I was a teenager. And then um, then I went to Dubai for eight years of my life. And then it's just kind of like you you make home wherever you are. Um, and for me, like I, I during the pandemic, I was stuck in the, uh, Russia for originally from Russia. So I was stuck in Russia for three and a half months. I like I flew and then everything shut down. So I was there for three and a half months. And what I've realized is because I left at a, you know, a significant age, I guess, you know, um, I don't feel home in Russia either. So I, you know, you feel, and that was a good test for me. So I find it interesting as much as, you know, and, and frankly speaking, I have more foreign friends than Russian friends. Um, and that's because I just never really, you know, assimilated into the Russian culture after I left. I was just like, and, and most, most Russians don't think I'm Russian even. And, and it's really funny. So I find it challenging because it's like, yeah, you want to be a this global citizen, but at the same time, you always feel like there's just like this, you're waiting, you're looking for this home, but you're not really sure. So you kind of have to make it where it is. But then when you see people that are like their communities, their childhood friends are in one country and you're like, I wonder what that's like, you know, do you ever feel that way? Yes and no, because I also came here as a teenager. So for me, like I've made a lot of friends here in the DC area and the community here is super international. You know, DC is very transient. So mm -hmm. what happens is like, I was in high school where there are a lot of people from international backgrounds because their parents worked at the local embassies. So now I have friends in a lot of countries all over the world that I can go visit. And including Israel, I have friends who are, went back after their uh, parents ended their um, diplomatic mission here. But at the same time, uh, after a year of being here and then going back to, to visit in Israel, I started feeling like a little of like, I'm not, I don't belong anymore because people have moved on. And even though I do still have childhood friends there, um, there are very few that are still like, you know, it's easier to keep in touch. People have continued their life, have made other friends. They graduated high school without me. People went into the military service. They have all these stories. And then, you know, you go back there sometimes and you sit down and people tell all these like stories and you just, you can't relate because you, you didn't go through that with them. But then at the mm -hmm. same time, I have a lot of local friends here in the DC area from I mean, childhood, I guess, teenage years that, uh, you know, we can relate to to each other. So it's kind of a combination of both. And then one thing I find very interesting that I heard from other people, too, is that sometimes people go back to their country of origin after several years of living abroad and they're being judged by their, by their family or friends like, oh, you've been so, I don't know, Americanized or you're so mm -hmm. French now since you left, you know, 
some other country. Um, so it, it's interesting. Yeah, that that's a great point. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, I can definitely relate to that. But it's a, uh, it's very interesting. It's it's like it's almost like people feel like it's like so where like what what should I be doing? How should I be acting? Like you know, it's not like you can just turn. You just you are who you are. You develop how you develop. So that's interesting. Um, that yeah, it's it's very powerful for people to understand that it's pretty normal to 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 experience those things. Um, so when you started the podcast, did you you know you know why did you choose the format of a podcast versus I don't know anything else? Like what was it about the podcasting? You know the the audio piece that you you found interesting versus like doing interviews on video or I mean obviously podcast can be video and audio as well, but why the podcasting route and not like, I don't know, interviews and writing a book? Right. Oh, <laughs> you just touched on the answer because that's an interesting point. So the podcast happened very kind of accidentally. Um, I was uh, volunteering in an organization called Girl Security. I still do as a mentor. And I met a fellow mentor at one of our uh, virtual gatherings who uh, expressed that she also has struggled with kind of accent and being an immigrant. And I reached out to her just, hey, let's have coffee, let's chat. And we started chatting and she started telling me how she's writing a book about something. And I told her about my idea to help immigrants and all that. And she said, well, why don't you write a book? And I said, you know what? I'm really not a fan of like long writing. I don't think I'll do a good job writing a book. Uh, but I don't know. She's like, well, how about a podcast? I said, well, you know what? <laughs> Let me look into this. <laughs> And literally that was September and then October, November of last year, I started looking into that. And in December, I did the back end of it and launched the podcast in January. Um, so, and then I interviewed her on my podcast in one of the episodes. So um, it was kind of closing that, that circle. But I think this is just the beginning for me. I'm uh, working on a social entrepreneurship venture um, to build a community for immigrants. Uh, so there's going to be more to come. I'm partnering with other organizations that are also kind of celebrating refugees and immigrants. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of that storytelling and a lot of other things to build that community. Mm, that's awesome. And um, that actually, I mean, you could actually, there's so much content you can get from, from, from the, the, the content that you're going to create, uh, you know, that you are creating as part of your podcast. So you could turn it into transcribe it and then turn it into a book after all maybe one day cool. yeah i think that <laughs> i don't cool. want to make any promises yes yes no promises um so and um another question for you is um i guess how do you balance between you know because that's the question people say you know when you when you see somebody who's like you know has a has a corporate job and i'm sure that keeps you very busy and then you have your podcasting how do you balance that how do you find your guests um you know how often do you release your podcasts so my podcast is uh, once a week. I release a new episode. Um, I find guests in very different ways, from cold messages on social media to LinkedIn and uh, attending events that have and volunteering with refugees and immigrants, uh, word of mouth through friends, like really a variety of um, ways. Um, about balancing, I think if you really are passionate about something, you'll find a way. And I think it's a matter of just learning to set those boundaries between your corporate career and your side passion mm -hmm. and just time management. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so what are you looking forward to in 2023 when it comes to, to the conversations that you're going to continue with the theme of immigrants and entrepreneurship? Um, are you thinking about opening up another theme? So I think series, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I'm really excited to continue the podcast and continue uh, building the communities and expanding on interviews, both of just immigrant stories and also immigrant entrepreneurs. So if anybody uh, wants to share their story, I'm always happy to host new people. I'm also looking forward to a lot of other projects that I can't share right now that I'm working on with other organizations that are related to the podcast and the um social entrepreneurship venture. Mm, that's awesome. Um, I, I, love the, I love it that you said that when people, when you care about something and I'm sure uh, it's for you, it's just fun. So it's almost like, you know, it's, it's like something you probably get energy from versus it's not draining, right? Because you enjoy the, having these conversations. So it's probably, yeah. even though it's, you know, it might be something that, you know, yet you have to make time for it, but it's, it's not draining you. And I think that's the, that's a lot of 
that's the people a lot of people have this challenge is they're doing work that's usually draining for them and then on top of that if they have to do something in the evening that's also draining then it's just it's just a miserable um situation to be in right and, right and a lot of i mean i'm lucky yeah. enough that i love my corporate career and i have a lot of fun there and but also at the same time i'm very passionate about this and you know there's this cliche statement that i've heard so many times lately is like when you start your day first, like work for yourself before you work for somebody else. So I try to start my days with working on the podcast and doing some things, but I mean, we're all human. Don't get me wrong. There yeah. are days where I'm just so tired and really want to do something else and sit down and edit a podcast and create the content. But I have a mission and I want to, you know, you just discipline, you keep pushing yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how do you stay disciplined? What is, what are your routines look like? Do you have a specific routine? I'm not a big fan of like uh, routines. Uh, I heard this phrase one day that routines can be lethal. I don't know. I'm just, I get bored very quickly. So I try to change it up. I mean, there are some non-negotiables such as working out, work and the podcast, but then around it, just try to be flexible. Um, I really like to start, like I said, in the morning with doing some things for myself before I start the corporate career. And making sure I also like find time throughout the week to get out and go to these events that are related to my podcast and my um, entrepreneurship venture and, and meet fellow like-minded people. So like mm -hmm. one uh, event that I recently was very lucky to attend was um, DC Startup Week. And mm -hmm. I presented there about my podcast and I think it's an incredible community. They do events throughout the year as well. Um, so just, you know, finding those things to actually break the routine is what I try to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, and uh, what is the one question you, you wish people would ask themselves more often? That's uh, interesting. Um, I think, I mean, very cliche, but life is so short. And for me recently, um, my grandfather passed away very like instantaneously, like in the morning, he sent some emails in the evening, he had dinner and he passed away after dinner. And he asked us to write something on his gravestone, like he had it ready. And what he asked us to write is, um, if I translate it, it sounds something along the lines of like, don't feel bad that I'm gone, feel thankful that I existed. Mm -hmm. So to me, that inspired me to think is like, what do you want to be remembered for? I think that's the question that guides me every day, especially recently, is everything I do at work, outside of work, with friends and family, what do I want people to remember me as? Hmm. That, that, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm sorry for your loss, but that, that, is, a, that is a beautiful statement. Um, and so if, if somebody wants to get in touch with you or they want to you know, um, just, just connect with you, where do you mostly hang out with on social media? So on social media, I'm, I have an Instagram page for the podcast. Uh, and then I also have a Facebook page. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. There is a page for the podcast. So you can find me there or on my website. So I'll uh, send it to you so you can link it in the notes. Sounds good. I'll make sure to put all of that in the episode notes. And one more question for you, Anna. If you had a magic wand to change anything in the world, what would that be? Sure. First, I have to say, so it's Anna <laughs> and I do that oh, yeah, all the I'm time. Sorry, it's all good. And I do that all the time because I used to like not correct people. But then, you know, I no, think thank you. Thank you for correcting me. I appreciate it. Uh, to, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think for that question, I would like to pivot it to something super different from like my podcast and my career. Something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, if I had a magic wand, is I think that the education system in the U.S. really needs to be changed. And what I mean by that is that I think that children are not taught things that are super useful for them in life, like entrepreneurial, you know, ideas, like more working more on creativity, working more on loving yourself and respecting yourself and being confident and how all of these things impact you, even if you're in the corporate world. Um, I think there are so many skills that can be taught in the education system that are not taught. And mm -hmm. we could really, my dream would be if we could really adjust the education system to individuals and not teach everybody the same thing, the same template. I think mm -hmm. that would be really helpful for the future. 
Yeah, well, you have uh, you have uh, opened up a Pandora's box for me because um, I am uh, my audience knows how much I speak on on this topic of uh, changing the education system. I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, I, I, but I'm I'm curious now. I have to ask you, why do you think is it that we're just your opinion? Why do you think is that everybody we we all know this? Like we, everybody agrees, every like parents, uh, kids that graduate high school, like yeah, I wish I would have learned that, and we keep telling this to the educators and the policymakers, but it doesn't happen. Why do you think that is? It, it is happening, but very slowly. Why do you think yeah, that? Yeah, very slowly. And I think that the burden is more on the parents to find these extracurricular activities for your kids to get these other skills. I think that we're creatures of habit. I think that uh, the education system as a whole, but a lot of people who are powerful there are scared to change because if something worked that way for so many years, why would we change it? Like we're gonna mm. miss something if we don't teach kids algebra. But with all due respect to algebra, I haven't used it since I graduated. <laughs> Neither have I. And I am doing pretty well. So, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, it, it's, it is hard to, to change. And I think that um, it's almost like, you know, people see change as a threat, right? It is a threat to like everything, yeah. the, who we are. Um, and then when you try to change systems, that becomes very challenging because then you, you're, you're trying to change the minds of so many people that are involved right. in this process. Um, so, yeah, but that's a whole, that's a whole other conversation for a different podcast because like in my <laughs> audience knows I can go down rabbit holes in this for hours on this topic. Um, I rant about it all the time and try to do something about it with, with, with kind of my startups. But, um, anyway, uh, Anna. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank I'm going to you. make sure to share all the links um, with my audience in the in the notes. And for those that are listening, uh, please connect with Anna um, and uh, support the, the social cause she's going to be, uh, uh, you know, she's going to be working on. So I look forward to hearing about that. And maybe we can have another chat uh, once you do all the awesome things in 2023. Absolutely. Thank you so much and happy new year. Happy new year.